all loose items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. You know, recently I've been thinking about how, for decades, Disney parks photography sort of fell into two camps. You had glossed up promo shots from the company, and pages of slightly fuzzy snapshots taken by your mom on vacation, and then, of course, thrown into an album and rarely seen again. But the internet changed all that. Now we publish our favorite shots to the world, and for some reason, with the right set of hashtags, and more importantly, the right eye for detail, your photos might just be the gateway for fans all across the globe wanting a small taste of the magic from afar. Our guest today is Luis Garcia Ricciani, a computer guy by day and a Disney photographer by night, with an audience of almost 200,000 under the handle Disney Nuts on Instagram. We talk about how he first got interested in photography with a camera he got from Kentucky Fried Chicken, yeah, you heard that right, and what it takes to get those gorgeous shots at the end of the night when everyone else is heading towards the exit. All of that and more is coming right up here on Dream Finders. Luis Garcia Ricciani, welcome to Dream Finders. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. So many, 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 many people have seen your theme park photography online. It's wonderful stuff. Um, but they may not know much about the man behind the camera. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up. So um, I basically grew up in Puerto Rico. And um, even though I was born in Philadelphia, I've lived in Puerto Rico probably the last 30 years. And in 2005, um, I had actually come to Disney a bunch of times like everybody else. You know, every other year would come here for you know, during different times of the year, uh, mm-hmm. Christmas time, Halloween, and stuff like that. So um, my company that actually what I was working for at the moment was in uh, Shady Waters. And um, we've always said, me and my wife, that if anything happened to the company that we would move to uh, move to Florida, have to be close to Disney because we mm-hmm. always found it such a magical place. It's sort of like the, the way, uh, a place where you can disconnect and stuff like that. So in 2005, um, the company that I was actually worked for the, um, closed out. And we hopped on a plane and headed over to Florida. So uh, we've been here since 2005. And um, my wife quickly uh, got a job with um, with Disney. Um, I worked and I still work with a totally different company, nothing related uh, uh, with Disney wise. And being in the home so so much, the wife eventually said, you know what, you need to get out. You cannot be here all the time. So uh, she said, I'm going to get you a camera because I know you like photography mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So um Basically, uh, got a camera, a DSLR for uh, for Christmas, the basic camera, nothing fancy, and headed to the parks, and and that's where I basically started. Um, as for me, I, I work a regular job, eight to five. I, I work with computers and always have, and um, the photography thing basically came as a hobby, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's been great ever since. Let's talk a little bit about your childhood. What did your parents do for a living? Um, my father was actually in the army. He was a doctor. So um, we did travel a lot, which is why I was actually born in Philadelphia. We, we were stationed there for a while. We uh, uh, actually were also stationed a bit in uh, North Carolina and some other places. Mm-hmm. And um, that's basically where uh, I, I guess it, it all <laughs> it all started. So yes, he was a doctor in, in, in the army. So there's some creativity in in that sort of uh, field, of course. Um, did did you come from a family of creatives in general? Did you find was you know um, uh, photography something that was around the house a little bit? Technology has changed in a way that it's much easier to do photography now, of course. Um, but uh, what what was uh, your family like? Was it a creative family? I would say yes, because my mother loved the paint, loves the paint, and she still does. Um, I have always had a camera in my hands, and I, I can go back all the way to the time uh, with film. Did you get forced to try piano, or were there other creative outlets besides photography that you uh, found uh, some interest in at a young age? Yes, music. Uh, I, was, uh, I do love music. I do play a couple of instruments, and um, you know, I have done all the... All the fun stuff, uh, like with bar bands and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, yes, I do love creative uh, stuff regarding uh, anything that has to do with creating and expressing your way. It's I love doing that, and I guess 
with the photography, it's one of the ways that I've been able to do that. And, and, and it's, it's a great way to, uh, you know, unplug and do your thing, I get, I guess. Um, so you grew up, of course, with uh, a love of Disney. Uh, generally, uh, it's rare for someone to come into adulthood and be like, I think I love Disney now. So tell us a little bit about what your experience was with Disney um, at an early age and, uh, you know, the opportunities to go to the parks and, um, and, and any of that. Growing up, I, it was it was always awesome to head into, you know, get into the plane and we're going to Disney. And um, I, I luckily I, I was able to see, you know, how Epcot when it opened up and I was able to see, you know, Animal Kingdom and Hollywood Studios after that. So it was it was amazing. I, we loved it. It was such a such a fun time. Um, and that time it, it's really funny because we never uh, we used to have actually um, station wagons. There wasn't minivans at those times. And mm. I was always the one sitting in the back, <laughs> you know, in the, in the little back seat, which was which was awesome. Me and my brother, we would be sitting in the back. I loved it. I loved it. It was always so amazing how how Disney would hide everything. You know, at that age, I remember my father saying, you can walk down the street and you don't even see a little plug outlet, a cable, nothing. It's perfect. And we were always just like in awe. And mm. we, we would even prep ourselves sometimes before coming over uh, to the parks. We'd have, uh, you know, we'd have records and we'd play the records before we, uh, we, we actually took our trip. So we'd be all psyched up and all that stuff. And Oh, uh, we loved it. It was such a such an awesome, and it is still an awesome, uh, a, such an awesome time, you know, to, to go and, and and remember that and see it and still see it. It's 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 still amazing to me. So you mentioned that you had the opportunity to see uh, Epcot in its infancy. So do you have any memories of that park in its early days? I, I think everyone um, really there's a there's a certain fandom that really loves um, early Epcot. Uh, any sort of things that stick out to you about that time? Yes, yes. And one thing I think which was really cool was when you would walk into Epcot and the first thing you would see was the little stations where you can actually do the reservations for dinner. I just found it so cool that you'd walk up to a screen and, you know, somebody <laughs> would pop up and you could do the reservations like right there. I'm like, how cool is that? You know, um, obviously Spaceship Earth, when you first walk in, that's just the, the coolest thing, you know, uh, like the massive size and how perfect it is and, and from any angle. It, it's just I still remember walking in for the first day, and we just we just like stopped. We we all stopped and looked at it, and like, oh my god, look <laughs> at this, you know. When did um, you mentioned that you took an interest in photography at a pretty early age? Um, do you remember what sort of incited that for you? I've always tried to capture moments. People, I know people don't like it when I come up and take photos of them all the time, but I've always found that they always like looking at the photos later. Mm. Like, oh, don't take a photo of me. But then uh, if I bring these photos up a year or two, uh, two years later, they'd, they'd love to see them. Um, I was always the person around the house with the camera. I, I don't know why. I just, um, I guess I didn't like being on the other side of the camera. So <laughs> I, I said, let me, let me grab the camera before I'm stuck on the other side. What was the fir very first camera? The first camera you're gonna laugh was actually it was a Kentucky Fried Chicken 35 millimeter <laughs> uh, camera they'd give out for free, and I actually took it to Disney one of my first trips to Disney, and I, it was it was great. You know, I had 24 shots, and if it was, I was lucky, I can buy the 36 shot roll, and um, it was always great. To um, once we headed out of Disney, uh, I would head over to one of those little huts and you know get mm -hmm. the uh, get the photos developed and. You know, that that has to be the one of the hour because I want to see the photos today, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. something I don't even think about now is the fact that when you were in the parks, you could get your photos developed so you could see them at that time or very near to that while you were still on vacation. That's super fascinating. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and I have we have a, a bunch of them, the ones that we used to do on Main Street uh, where you used to dress up and you used to take the photos. We have the one where we used to. I think it's the train where the whole family's standing, and we're holding, and we got like the train behind us, and I have another one where, where, where we're dressed up as pirates. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. So you proclaim to be self-taught. Um, how did you first start diving into photography? When you got past sort of like, I like taking photos. I know that KFC has graciously given me a camera. By the way, how long did that camera last? It seems like it wouldn't last very long, but uh, you no, seem to it, take it, it didn't last too long. Yeah, <laughs> one drop and that was it. And it popped open and then it didn't, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so what kind of got you to that next step of um, let's let's go past KFC. Let's, let's move in and see why I'm enjoying photography, how I can do it better. What, what kind of got you into that um, realm? Okay, well, I think watching other people's photos, um, I was 
pretty much before doing all the Instagram thing, I, I used to uh, go around a lot on Flickr and some of the other social mm. sites that that had that are big in photography. And I, and I used to see some other people's photos like, wow, that is so awesome. Look at that, how how clean it looks, how, how you know, the sky and it's so blue and the stars. And, and I wonder how I did this and how I did that. And then with the uh, with the wonders of, of uh, like YouTube, you know, and, mm. and all the self stuff that's out there. Little by little, little it was little by little that I um, wanted to do the jump, and and it got to a point where you realize that the equipment that you're using can do up to certain limitations, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably the one thing that I always tell everybody that know what your equipment can do, uh, because I knew at that moment with the camera that I had, which was a point and shoot, I knew I couldn't do uh, like let's say like long exposures, which is where you get those really nice clean, crisp, dark mm -hmm. shots. I knew at that moment I said, okay, I can't do this on this camera. Um, so that's when I started investigating, okay, what camera can do it? And um, and that's how little by little I jumped into the DSLR field, which is what people consider like the professional cameras. And I, and I started small, actually. Um, I actually went to um, like these major chains, uh, Target, and uh, have uh, the cameras that you can actually see, like the Rebel series. And I went with the Canon. And because I did a couple of research and I saw that uh, the Canon and, and, and I could be wrong, that the lenses were cheaper than Nikon and stuff like that. Mm. So I ended up buying the lowest um, and line of the Canon, which was the Rebel series, and I started with that. And uh, little by little, I started trying new things. And uh, I had, luckily, I had the advantage that I can head to the parks pretty often. So um, little by little, I started experimenting and trying this, trying that. And 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 I and I, I I'm telling you, at the real beginning, my photos were just terrible. I would <laughs> I would shoot, I would shoot parades, and they would come out all white, overexposed, and you know, out of focus. And I say, okay, that doesn't work. Let me try something else. And, and little by little, it's just been little by little. Do you find um, that you have a favorite park or at least an area in a park that you seem to gravitate to, f to doing photography uh, of more than any other? Oh, yeah, definitely. And that would be actually Epcot. And the reason for that is the sunsets in Epcots are always amazing. You can get so many angles of all the pavilions with the sun coming down that it's never ending. It's never ending for me. Uh, along those lines, is there a specific ride that you find to be um, challenging to get, but always uh, interesting? Yes, Peter Pan. In that case, would be Peter Pan at Magic Kingdom. That's always the hardest one for all of us photographers. And the reason for that is obviously it's moving so fast, and you're swinging around, and it's so dark that it's it's a challenge. It's it's a fun challenge to do. So, what's the balance then between like planning ahead? And then also spontaneity, because you can't plan for everything. You know, you you might know where the sun's going to set, but you're you're not always, you know, aware of maybe well this firework is going to be you know seen from this angle at this thing, and you sort of you know the spontaneity of photography in any sort of live um, atmosphere is there. How did you sort of balance that out at a theme park? Um, well, I try. It's funny that you say that because that that that's totally true. Um, you try to be original on, on your photos because uh, you want to show something that's um, while it's maybe been seen before, but I try to do something uh, different. And I'll force myself. For example, I'll walk in with one lens only, which I do mm. a lot. I'll just put one lens on the camera and walk in. Um, but I will have at least a general idea of what I want to do. For example, if I'm heading to Epcot, I know that the sunsets. Uh, are good, uh, but I have this lens, so I can zoom in to, to you know, to a pavilion. I need to do it from the backside. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's one thing that I do there. I, I force myself, you know, put a different lens on there. I said I'm going to shoot it with this setting to see how it looks, and uh, that way when I come home, usually I find some interesting results. Yeah, and there's certainly, um, I think, the difference between someone who goes to the parks and wants to do sort of photography, and they live in, you know. Kansas or whatever, and someone who lives close, you have that ability to kind of come back and reassess. Um, have you found that, like, how long has it taken to do, a, like, a, a challenge you really wanted to do in photography at the parks that it took you multiple days or multiple attempts? Oh, definitely. Um, I guess the classic shots, the ones with the empty streets, those are the ones that are probably the hardest to do. And those I've had actually to go back a couple of times because um, it's not something that I shoot often, because sometimes when you want to get that really nice wide shot of, the, of Cinderella's castle with all the turrets on the side, it's not as easy as it, as it looks. And that one has, has actually probably one of the challenging ones because I have to go back and, and try different settings and stuff like that because it's not something that you can practice 
you know, there's only one, there's, a, there's that Cinderella castle, there's that street, there's that situation. So that's one that's, uh, strangely enough, it's been challenging for me. So, Yeah, and, and that's sort of a, I don't even want to use the word genre, but I think I will, a genre of Disney theme park photography is this sort of serene, um, almost empty, maybe there's a person's head like way in the background yeah. or something of that nature, but it's pretty serene. It, of course, there's the the other flip of that, which is many people and, and get that vibe of, of people in the audience and all that sort of thing. Those yeah. serene shots, though, um, how, I mean, you mentioned how difficult that is to accomplish, but how do you even begin? Is it is it just being there at the right time? Is it is it about going super late or super early? Yeah, um, it all depends on the park. For example, um, in the case of Magic Kingdom, what I always tell everybody that, because um, usually the park closes after the, the fireworks go off, and what I like to do is I head back to one of the one of the ta- one of the lands. For example, if I want to shoot the area of pirates with nobody in it, I'll head over to Splash Mountain, and I'll shoot the fireworks from there, and then little by little walk my uh, walk forward towards the park, and many times, you know that area will be empty. So, hmm. And the same thing uh, with Tomorrowland. Now, I do tell people that if you're going to try to get those empty shots, that you have to pick a land because you cannot be in Tomorrowland and expect to head over to the frontier land and take a shots with nobody because the park will be closed and there'll be ropes up and stuff like that. Um, so um, with in the case of Epcot, it's funny because many of the shots of the pavilion that I've taken that are empty, there's actually people behind me. Hmm. Um, when the park is closed and people are walking out, many people are actually walking behind uh, behind me instead of inside the pavilion so I can get those shots. Sometimes, uh, if you're lucky that, you can get away with that. Sometimes you, you have to just be patient and wait 20, 30 minutes. Uh, in the case of the, the hub shots of Magic Kingdom, easily two hours. Hmm. Easily two hours because there's still people hanging around the hub. So, What is doing photography in a theme park taught you about people who go to theme parks is you, you talk a little bit about crowds and how they sort of move and getting sort of a um an instinct about where you can shoot but have what have you learned about how people respond to you and your camera some people some people like it some people don't some people for example if they see you taking a shot i don't expect them to move but many of the people many of the people will move mm. Um, I don't expect them to move because we're all there, you know, with the same uh, privilege to being there. So I don't expect them to move. So many times I'll just wait. Yeah, it's uh, that's an interesting question. Actually, I've seen a ton, tons of, uh, of, of you know, of proposals, which is which is always awesome. Always during the Christmas time, there's tons of proposals on Main Street, the Cinderella's Castle. I was able to actually shoot one one time, which was really, really amazing. They had actually had. Uh, uh, they were able to get uh, the the stage area, so I saw a proposal being done there, which was really nice. Uh, are there any moments that stick out to you in the photography you've taken? Like, are there a, is there a certain photo that you go back to and kind of go like, this was like a, a like maybe a perfect sort of moment? I wouldn't have been able to capture this again. I would say yes, yes. There's one photo that I think started it all for me, which was a, like the whole night photography and stuff like that, and. I haven't. It's funny because I haven't been able to recreate it, and it was actually a shot that I took at the Italy Pavilion. It was my first, I guess, long exposure where I saw the photo. And I said, "Wow, that that's cool," and that's what I want to continue to learn and continue to do. And I've gone back to try to shoot the same uh, photo, and I haven't been able to hmm. do it. Strangely, even with better equipment <laughs> at that time, the equipment that I had was like just starter equipment, and the photo came out just like perfect lighting and perfect. You know, the shades and the shadows and everything was just like perfect. And I'm like, how does, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's probably the shot that I would say that I haven't been able to recreate for some reason. Well, if good cameras aren't working, maybe try that KFC camera if you can get one at, yes. on auction. Maybe that would, yes. maybe going back <laughs> the other way would help. Um, maybe I could find it on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, you know, you've gained quite a following on Instagram. Did that surprise you? Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's funny because I started the Instagram account because – people on my Facebook page were tired of seeing all my Disney photos because <laughs> once I got sort of like the hang of it, I would post Disney photos all the time and my family and friends were like, oh, there he is with another Disney photo. There he is at Disney one more time. And somebody said, why don't you just open up an Instagram account? I said, okay, let me check that out. And as soon as I posted a couple of shots, it's um, it, it got some likes and I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And and I started seeing where the people who had actually liked it from and there were like uh, a couple people who were from uh, – 
there's uh, from Brazil, Italy, and I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool that I can post a photo and somebody around the world actually liked it. And um, little by little, I, I, I realized that if I would post photos, um, I don't want to say frequent, but at least on a consistency, it would it would grow. And that's what I've uh, been doing. For example, um, I tell these people that for the last five years that I've had the account, I post daily mm. and I haven't missed a day yet. And that's helped tremendously. And, um, you know, you try to you see uh, you, you more or less get a feel of how uh, how the people react to the photos and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, it, it's it's been amazing, uh, to be honest with you. I didn't expect any of it uh, to, to eventually explode as it did, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's humbling, it's humbling and, and it's, I have no complaints here. <laughs> Do you find that there is a Disney photography sort of, I don't want to say club, but there, is there a group that you sort of see around the parks kind of frequently that you all have that same interest? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. There's a tons of friends of mine. And that's another cool thing that I love of, of, of the Instagram that I've, I've met some really wonderful uh, people photographers of all ages and all skills and um oh yeah i i see a certain set of friends all the time which is really funny because we always run into each other and it's always it's always fun to shoot with them now something that you've started to do um in a while, for a while now um is on your youtube channel um you give sort of instructions and sort of uh, it feels like you're giving back to the self-taught YouTube community um, in many ways that you sort of learned from what made you decide to do that well it's funny because um, a couple of people have asked me how did I take certain shots and settings and stuff like that because I'll get messages all the time like saying uh, what camera do you use and what lens are you using and when I started I found that I don't want to say difficult but I did find that it was a little bit uphill and frustrating like I said, going to the parks and coming back and seeing the stuff all white and stuff. And I said, um, it would have been cool to have somebody to show me maybe the basics. And um, and while there's a ton of YouTube videos out there, I didn't find any that was really like related to Disney stuff only, which is what I tried to do in this channel was keep it focused to Disney stuff, like shooting from inside the parks and stuff like that. Because, again, there's tons of videos out there about, you know, camera settings mm. and stuff like that. But. I wanted to show people what I the issues that I had, like getting on a ride, and I want to be able to shoot this thing when I'm on Thunder Mountain because it's really fast. What settings do I use? What lens is good? So I wanted to do something where people could jump right in, get a camera, and say, okay, I know how to shoot Thunder Mountain. I want to be able to capture the train while it's going by. I want to be able to to go to the Navi River and you know and and be able to get a really cool shot, you know. Uh, and, and so that's that was the whole idea, and and. And it's been great. It's been great. Now, this, of course, has forced you to sort of be in front of the camera. How has vlogging been different for you than, say, taking just normal photography? Oh, it's been it's it's been a uh, it's <laughs> um it's it's two, I guess it's two parts. One, I wanted to do it because I know that I'm I'm bad in front of the camera, meaning you know talking in front of the camera. So I wanted to force myself because I want to get through that barrier of being in front of the camera. So that was one thing that I was determined to do, and it was it, it was really going uphill to be honest. It was a real struggle. The real first ones are just like, I look at them now and they're just just terrible, <laughs> you know. And and uh, I cringe at how tense I look. Now it's been uh, you know after a couple of videos, it's actually gotten better. And I, I think it's gotten better. It feels more natural, and I try to show the natural side of it. But it's 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 still a struggle. It's still a struggle to be honest with you. So one of the things that Disney has a lot of is dark rides. They literally call them dark rides. And of course, every ride you hear a very specific thing, which is no flash photography. So how yeah. does one deal with that and wanting to also get good photos? Okay, so first thing is actually the lens is really important when you're doing those type of shots because you need to have a lens that what they call a fast lens or a prime lens or a lens that has a really wide aperture. An aperture, for example, is the number that the lens can uh, uh, can do. In this case, um, the common one out there is the 1.8 or the nifty 50, which people like to call it. And that 1.8, what it allows is that it's really open wide. Like when your uh, your eye opens in the dark, it's, it's very similar to that. And what it does is that it allows a lot of light to come in. And this way you can set your camera to a somewhat faster speed and it won't come out blurry so that's probably the the first thing i always tell everybody you need to have a fast lens 
And the Nifty 50, um, which is the 50 millimeter lens, is probably the cheapest option out there for people to start. And it's also great for, for portrait photography. And then the other thing is the camera. The camera needs to be able to shoot at a high ISO, which is why the camera that I have now, um, basically, I know it can do that, So, which is one of the reasons why I got this camera. And the high ISO allows you to put the shutter speed pretty fast so you don't get that blurry shot. So the combination of the high speed lens or the prime lens and the high ISO on the camera is how you're able to get those dark shots. What's a big mistake when you started out in theme park photography that now that you look back, you wish you would have known at the start? I guess the limitations of the camera that you have, and I know it sounds uh, probably um, probably basic, but I was trying to do, for example, let's say like dark scenes photography with the camera that I had that it just couldn't do it. You know, I guess that's the number one thing that that I always tell everybody is that make sure you know the limitations and what your camera can and can't do, uh, because that will save you a bunch of of, of, of issues. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, The newest camera that I got actually is somewhat considered a sports camera Mm. because I know it can take um, very high speed uh, shots. So I know I can take really good shots of Thunder Mountain and stuff like that. The first camera I had would never be able to do something like that. So I was, you know, getting pretty frustrated when I was trying to shoot certain stuff that, uh, you know, like I said, Thunder Mountain and it wouldn't come out okay, and, you know. So I guess it's learn the equipment that you have. And again, you can have any equipment. And as long as you know the limitations and what it can and can't do, you can do anything. Is there a park that you'd love to photograph, but you've not had the opportunity to yet? Oh, Tokyo. Tokyo, definitely. I would love to see that. And and obviously, Shanghai, the, the stuff that I see coming out of that park is just amazing. I would love to go to Shanghai. The, the, the fireworks show over there, and the it's just that's probably my number one uh, on my bucket list. If you met a young amateur photographer who wanted to do theme park stuff and they're pretty down on their, you know, luck because of, as you sort of explained, you know, the um, sort of first attempts at everything kind of come out pretty terrible. It takes time. Um, What advice would you give to that young photographer? I would first say it's okay to shoot in automatic because many people, uh, focus on you know going into manual mode on their camera right away that's uh, probably a bad idea go ahead and shoot automatic see what the camera um does for you you know as for the setting wise uh, another thing i always recommend people is uh, look at other people's work for example uh what i liked about Flickr, for example is that it will show you the camera settings that people were using for their photos so it sort of like gives you a base of the settings that people use on those type of shots and little by little, get out of the automatic mode, you know, so um, but don't try to jump into it right away. You know, it's OK to shoot manual if that's what works. Again, what's important is the end result. If the photo looks good, it looks good. It doesn't matter how you got there. And um, little by little, little by take small steps, you know, OK, I'm going to get out of uh, automatic mode. I'm going to put it into priority, a shutter priority mode and try that and see how this works. I'm going to shoot it now in this other mode, see how this works. And then little by little, you start learning the, the, you know, what the camera is doing and what, what settings work for you. And then you can get into something like manual mode and start adjusting all the other stuff. But it's okay to have a DSLR and start with the uh, automatic mode. It is okay. Lewis, thank you so very much for coming on DreamFinders. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this episode of DreamFinders. I'd like to thank Lewis for being my guest. Check out all his amazing photos at his Instagram, Disney underscore nuts, or search for that on YouTube to find all his instructional videos. Our podcast artwork is provided by JP Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the world leader in Disney Parks News. Read all they have to offer at WDWNT.com. DreamFinders is hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Tell your friends about the show, and hey, don't forget to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts so other Disney fans like you will give us a listen. If you or someone else you know would also make a great guest on the program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. <laughs>